Welcome back to another episode with Fight Night Picks. As always, we're brought to you by Simbody. Vertiball is now Simbody. If you head on over to their website, simbody.com, you're going to get all the great products that you know and love, including the Simbody Vertiroller and the Vertiball that you have seen most likely here in studio. Look at that. Place it, lock it, attach it, Vertiball, all sorts of great stuff over there if you want to roll out those old tired muscles and you don't want to go with that old lacrosse ball. They are also coming out with that very new product that you can see right in front of you. And if I head on over to my cart, look at that. I've already got a Vertiball over there. A little bit of a deal right there. And if you hit the try for 60 days risk-free, use the promo code FNP, you're going to get 20% off your order with that code FNP at Simbody.com. You're really, really helping out another local company here in New Brunswick, Canada. Can't wait for it. The new name, Simbody at Simbody.com. And as we always say, let's get into it. You know the guys from Fight Night Picks for their weekly UFC previews and predictions. Live shows like Question Mark Kicks and the Sidekick. Thanks to your support, they're adding a new show to the channel. If you're an MMA fan, you're going to want to join in the action of Dana White's Contender Series. So as they always say, let's get into it. Just like that, we're back. We're set for Dana White's Contender Series. Week number four, it's a five-fight slate. And I can't wait for it. There's a lot of all-action fighters on this card. Plenty of finishes split between them. And when we look back through the overall season, I mean, first week, one contract to Joe Pfeiffer. The second week wasn't so bad. The third week... I mean, you had four contracts, but not really. You had three. And then in the main event, Bo Nickel gets cucked into coming back on Dana White's Contender Series. He's going to be taking part in a fight on September against 7-1. and one. Donovan Baird, the uh, CFFC middleweight champ. But Matt, I can't wait for this week with Contender Series. We got a lot of really, really interesting fighters. A lot of regional scene uh, champions, so to speak. And I mean, even in the co-main event, you have Yvonne Valenzuela taking on Claudio Herbero. And in that fight, I mean, both guys, middleweight champs, one over uh, with Lux Fighting Series and one with Future FC. So really want to thank the fans who have been able to tune in live, obviously with the UFC. It was a rough one last night. And I mean, listen, the the I, I almost want to say like the decade of dominance, it's over. But it's not over. We're looking forward to Contender Series so far. It's gone on very, very well. And what we do with this show where it is live and it is an angle into the fights coming up this week, you can see the two fighters next to us. You have Thomas Paul out of England taking on Esteban Ribovex. And I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I mean, in this one, Matt... These two guys have a great opportunity to earn a contract in a main event at lightweight. One of the best divisions in the UFC right now. I think we're going to see another one of these contender series weeks where a lot of contracts are handed out. Because like you had sort of said, these are going to be entertaining and exciting fights. And that's going to be the most exciting part about by the time we get to Tuesday night. Because I really do think like Jack Cartwright, Jose Johnson, is that going to a decision? Probably not. Like the main event, Thomas Paul versus Esteban, is that going to go to a decision? Probably not. And normally when you do get a lot of exciting finishes on cards like these, Dana White does like to reward people not named Bo Nickel because like you said, we've got to keep people watching this show somehow. But I really do think entertainment wise, this is probably the best card we've had so far. Yeah, 100%. And what we do with this Contender Series breakdown show, we're going to break down all five of the fights. We're each going to offer up one pick that goes towards that official record. Last week, we were both in agreement with the old Venezuelan man out of Costa Rica. It was Eric Silva to get the Looked win. Good over uh, a really, really tricky uh, glory lineage type kickboxer. But when we do look at the card coming up this week, first fight on the card, Nazib Saidukov taking on Abdul, Su or sorry, Ahmad Suhail Hazanzada. And in this fight, Matt, both these guys, very, very squeaky records. I mean, 6-1 versus 9-1. and one. This one is in that lightweight division as well. And when you look at it, I mean, 15 combined wins. 13 of them are by finish. And each one has a decision win to their credit. But I looked at it for both of these guys. If you look at it for Nazim Saidikov, uh, he's a guy that trains out of Longo Weidman MMA with guys like Dennis Bazukia, Winner, but not of a contract. And Charlie Campbell. Winning until he wasn't against Chris Duncan. Both guys on contender series as well this summer. And you have Saidikov looking to get off on the right foot against Hazan Zada, who comes out of a great gym in his own right. Team Alpha Male came over from Afghanistan. Obviously, they talked about that in some of his LFA fights. But this is a guy that has a lot of experience. He came into LFA 124, the co-main event against James Wilson. As a pretty big underdog, gets the win. Struggled in the wrestling exchanges, but looked really good when he was able to strike. And if you do look at it for Saidikov, 
uh, what, he took, like, I think it was three fights in the span of, like, less than a year, just over a year with Fury FC, just absolutely buzzsawed through the competition. The only real kind of critique that I have, and it's a critique with a lot of fighters on Dana White's Contender Series, is not a great level of competition. It's not really there for both guys. They're definitely fighting above their weight class, or they were the weight class that the guys were looking to fight above. So the only thing that I really wanted to note was, when you look at it for Saitikov, I read an interview that he had with MMA UK not that long ago, and I'll throw the quote up there right now, kind of talking about the fact that he had the opportunity to fight so often, but there was an opportunity to also take a short notice fight in the UFC. It seemed like they were hip to it. And then they kind of retracted that one. So now he's got a fight on Contender Series. So Saitikov kind of has that uh, presence already with the exactly. promotion. And so. it's not like they just forgot about him, not to interrupt. But it's not like they just said, oh, you're not getting a shot. You want to fight on the Ultimate Fighter Season 31 that maybe no one's going to watch? I really do like some of the strengths that I've seen out of Nazim, especially at the regional level. When he is able to get distance on his opponent, really put together his power shots, they are thrown with reckless abandon. He's not somebody who focuses a lot on his own defense. He will throw from the hip a little bit. Now, there is a huge positive to that. He hits extremely hard. He does put combinations together very well for a power puncher, I found. So I will be interested to see if he can get signed to the UFC because we were talking a little bit before the camera started rolling. If there is a weakness in his game. It's not that his takedown defense is bad by any means. He just struggles to gain some of that separation that I think he is going to need to have success at this level. So I think this is going to be an extremely fun fight because like you had said, both these guys' strengths do sort of overwind with the, or overlap with each other and both their weaknesses do as well. So this fight might just come down to who can outthink their opponent more than anything. Sadikov open at minus 150, minus 229 right now for Hazenzada open at a plus 130, plus 187. So I don't have a pick on this fight, my Myself. This isn't one that I, one of the ones that I'm gonna go with, but uh, I, I think it's a really good fight, a competitive fight at 155. Both guys have a decent level of competition in terms of okay, well they fought more than four or five times, like some of the fighters that we've seen this year on the season, but uh, not all that incensed by these two guys. And when I'm making a pick on this one, I want to go with the fighter that is most UFC ready. And it just so happens that this week, we actually have a fair bit of them. So we move into our next fight. It's at women's bantamweight. We have Haley Cowan, six and two, all hail Haley Cowan, taking on Claudia Leitchi out of Brazil. She trains out of Asher Fight Team with Josiana Nunes and Tyler Santos. So when I look at this one for Haley Cowan, you have to think that she's the one that the promotion yeah. wants to win. I mean, she was with LFA for the longest time. Ended that tenure with a loss to one and two. Uh, tricky, tricky fighter Kelly Clayton. She was a minus 425 favorite. Was Cowan to win that fight. She got submitted. She goes over to Invicta. Gets a win over uh, a fighter that's known. I guess, and 2-0, and Monica Franco. I mean, Franco had been out for two years. She was 37 in that fight. Cowan absolutely dominated the action in that one. Really strike to clinch, clinch to clinch, clinch to get the takedown. I mean, for Haley Cowan, the big story, obviously, she trains out of a big gym, elevation fight team, pound for pound fitness, with Miranda Maverick, who's on the card this weekend, UFC 278. But when you do look at it in this fight, Matt, again, for Haley Cowan, two-time All-American at Baylor University in acrobatics and tumbling. Wow. Can she tumble to a win in this fight? Because I think this is actually one of the trickier ones that's on this card. Have you ever seen those pie charts where it's like, oh, if a foundation in wrestling is 70% of like the UFC champions of all time, a little part of me wants to see Haley capture <laughs> UFC gold just so they can say that tumbling is one of the better bases for this sport. You are right, though. It does feel like she is not only the more recognizable name, because like you had said, LFA and Invictus, since those are always going to get you much more noticed than some of these other organizations well in the regional scene but at 30 years of age I feel like it might almost be too late for her on a show like this we have seen this sometimes on contender series where you have a bit of an older fighter with maybe not a crazy amount of experience they're not like 20 and 15 or anything but a fighter who just just doesn't feel as developed as their age might say that they should be like we were talking again before we started filming last night you had the Yasmins fighting each other a 23 year old and a 20 year old who after they were done fighting like I'm pretty excited to watch them go again I genuinely think they can be right in the organization for a long time. Both these fighters are going to have to put on a similar entertaining kind of a belt like that to really stir up interest. Yeah, I mean, both of them, they fight very similarly. For Claudia Leitchi, I mean, I saw it. She doesn't really have great strike and defense. Neither does Haley Cowan. They both like to throw in the pocket, but you're going to see Leitchi throw a lot more kicks out there. She doesn't move her head a whole lot. She just kind of keeps a high tie guard, so there are straight punches that will go through. Cowan likes to kind of throw in combination to really break things up, to push the action up against the fence. 
But I've seen Claudia Lecce defend a lot of takedowns. I've seen it from Cowan too. But for Lecce, she just seems to power through a lot of the positions. Great single leg, great double leg, really good body lock trip from Lecce. She is the cyborg MMA bantamweight champ. She was able to get the win there in her last fight. And from Lecce, I've seen a very, very interesting fighter. So I'll leave that one where it is. That's actually going to be the fight where my pick comes out of. So we'll move forward. We have Jack Cartwright coming in, the former Cage Warriors bantamweight champ. He is undefeated. He had to take, uh, you know, a fight on Dana White's contender series. Really reminds me of Albert Darayev or even Cage Warriors champ Jake Hadley is... Why does the Rat Tail King have to fight on Contender Series? And why is he fighting Jose Johnson? Jose Johnson's a guy that's fought on Contender Series. He lost against Ronnie Lawrence, got taken down on, what was it, 12 of 17 attempts. For Johnson, he very much is a striker, although he does have some submission wins. But he's one of those guys, it's like a guy working at McDonald's that has a, a PhD in neuroscience. Why are you here? What are you doing? You have way too much experience. 24 and 13 as an amateur, 14 and 7 as a pro. Again, Jose Johnson, very well known to the, uh, you know, American fans. I guess I'll say that. I'll limit it to American fans. Whereas Jack Cartwright, he's got all of Europe. He has to make an impact here on Contender Series. And when I saw this matchup, I went, well, geez, Cartwright's going to win on his wrestling alone. And then I went back and watched his fights. To open up his wrestling, he's got to go in there and bang. And she that's does. a that is a tall ask against Jose Johnson because Jack Cartwright usually tends to take a lot of punches before he gets into his groove and settles in. But that's why I think this fight is so much fun. This is like a big hurdle for Jack Cartwright because he does still need to prove to, like you said, the North American audience that he can hang and not only that he can hang, that he belongs to actually be in the UFC. And I feel like this fight against Johnson is going to be a great test for him because, like you said, he has to get into the pocket to really be able to accentuate his wrestling strengths. And if you just jump into the pocket recklessly against Gally Jose Johnson, Johnson, you are going to get hit and you're going to get hit a lot. Johnson has very nice power out of his right hand. Can throw it as a hook and can throw it as a straight. It's not like he only has one way of throwing that weapon. So I do think he is an extremely dangerous opponent for really any level of prospect who has hype behind them. Because we've talked about Johnson before on this channel. Oh, we yeah. go through other people's records. It's like, hey, well, they beat him. But like, still, a lot of his losses are to fighters who are now in the UFC or who have had 10 years in the UFC. So don't necessarily just look at his record and write him off because he's fighting an undefeated fighter. Because I think this is the fight that's really going to steal the headline by the time it's over. I, I The winner's probably going to get a title, or not a title, that would be insane. <laughs> the winner's probably going to get a contract based off of this fight just because Cartwright does sort of have the foundation and the experience that you would expect a UFC fighter to have. And that's why it is kind of surprising to see this fight be on Contender Series and not be like the opener for a fight night card. Yeah, I mean, for Jack Cartwright or Costanza, because we all remember that episode of Seinfeld, but for Cartwright, you look at it as last fight, like, he's getting headbutted by his opponent, and then it's like, Rich Mitchell's taking one point. Rich Mitchell's taking two points. You do it again, I'll disqualify you. Opponent does it again, Such and then a finally, head move. yeah, he loses by that. And for Jose Johnson, he's one and two with Dana White in the room. One loss on Contender Series to uh, Ronnie Lawrence. One loss on the Looking for a Fight Series to Mana Martinez. And then he gets a win on uh, Looking for a Fight with Fury because he just kept going to the well but, over there. And that's something we talk about a lot on this channel. It's, hey, I'd much rather him lose to guys who I know and recognize. You can watch any given Saturday on a UFC card than just these other fighters who we may not have heard about. Like, if you lose to people who then go on to fight in some of the biggest organizations of the world, it sort of lessens the impact of that loss in my mind, at least. Fair enough. When we move on to our next fight that we do have on this card Claudio Ribeiro Another the champion over with Future FC Future FC you know a lot of fighters out of Brazil that have come from that organization he's going to be taking on Ivan Valenzuela Bam Bam's the nickname like Taito Ivasa he is the Lux champion the middleweight champion over there and similarly last weekend we had a big time Lux champion big time finisher and Eric Silva taking on Anvar Boynazarov looked very very good so it'll be very interesting to see how Valenzuela makes out in this matchup. It's Mexico versus Brazil. It's a, a grudge match, the, you know, that's been going on since the dawn of time. It seems like Mexico Brazil is a very familiar stage. But when you look at this fight, Matt, was there anything that really stepped out? Because if we actually have a look at the odds in this matchup, it's one of the closer fights that's on the card. And I mean, you have a slight underdog in Valenzuela minus 102, slight favorite in Hebero at a minus 120. I think it's going to be a really fun fight while it lasts. And again, both these guys are. Proven finishers. I mean, for Valenzuela, seven of eight of his wins uh, are by finish, and they're all in round number one. Or, sorry, seven of his eight finishes, round number one. And if you look at it for Hibero, six of his nine wins are in the first round. All nine of his wins are by knockout. I just worry a little bit about Valenzuela's ability to sort of 
just temper his own gas tank. I do worry about him burning out very fast in this fight because for Ribeiro... You don't worry about both of them? I worry about both of them, but from what I've watched of Claudio, I just feel like he has more of a Goldilocks zone. He can sort of adjust his own levels of volume a little bit better throughout the fight, but that is a really big point that you bring up, and I think that's going to be a very important point in this fight. Who looks like they can withstand that 50-minute workload a lot better? Because we've seen this a lot on Contender Series where someone looks really good, they might even win by finish, and then Dana White just sits up there in his high horse with a monster energy can in front of him and he's like hey that guy's just not ready for the big show i couldn't disagree more i really do feel like the winner of this fight could be thrown into the ufc to fight really any of those entry level middleweight fighters and we've seen this a lot the middleweight division has really been on showcase in these uh, tuesday night contenders fights is it dana white's contender series or tuesday night? dana white's contender series. dana white's contender series fights so i really could see the winner of this getting a contract and i do see the winner of this ending by finish and that's really been the story on this whole entire card there's not a lot of these fights that i expect to go late into the third round and really need the judges around for it i know we'll talk about that even more in the main event so we'll get to the main event thomas paul you can see him on the left side of your screen taking on esteban karibovac so if we look at it matt in this fight i mean for thomas paul he is the 165 pound champ and 155 pound champ over with golden ticket fight promotions a and junior welterweight boy isn't that fun but if you look at it for paul he did get a win over one of my favorite guys perry andre goodwin in his last fight and he cold cocked him so bad with a left hook now paul is one of those guys where i've seen him had have to fight from behind in a lot of his fights and he just comes out swinging it doesn't matter if it's first round second round third round he can get behind on the volume game and he can struggle with his own wrestling and that's one of those things that i've looked at in his fights now in preparation for this one he's been training at all stars in sweden he's been training with arnold allen in england so you have two big english fighters in thomas paul and another guy in jack cartwright on this card and for thomas paul the incredible thing is like he's a hundred percent deaf so that's crazy like you see that in his fights the corner signing to give him you know any indication of what he needs it's to improve incredible. on round between round i mean askar askarov another fighter that's in the ufc that uh you know it has you know deafness going i guess so it really is tough for guys to make those changes on the fly and you look at it for thomas paul a great great striker a great great knockout artist he's taking on el gringo esteban ribovax and when i watch this guy fight matt out of argentina listen argentina needs prospects we've had uh you know only a few i mean santiago, santiago ponzinibbio is the biggest one luis eduardo garagori another fighter out of argentina but this is one of those fights where, again, you expect a finish. Uh, Ribovax is a pretty big favorite in this one as well. I want to make sure that I get this one right because he opened a minus 250, minus 354. We have a look for Thomas Paul. Open plus 210, plus 276. So Paul the underdog. You have the man to our right in uh, Ribovax as the favorite. But, man, these two guys are down to bang. And the way that I watch Ribovix, uh fight, because I've been saying Ribovax, Ribovix, when I watch him fight, Great volume, great power, good takedowns, good submission ability, and you don't—you hardly ever see his wrestling in his submissions either. Do you know who he reminds me of from last year's show? Michael Morales a little bit. Now, I know that is an extremely wild comparison to make because Morales has shown just how good he is at the UFC level, but if everything does work out for Esteban, I could see him becoming a similar fighter to Morales that we saw I believe it might have even been on week four of last year's show. So maybe they're more similar than we think. I love the striking out of Esteban and I could genuinely see him being in the UFC at one point and actually having success there. Now, don't let that overshadow the fact that Thomas Paul is a game opponent. Like you said, it doesn't matter how far behind he is in any one of his fights. He has the power that is the great equalizer to where if he lands a knee, a punch, a kick, he doesn't just rely on one weapon on the feet. So he is very dangerous in that aspect. But I think the reason that Esteban is such a big favorite is that if you do go back and watch a lot of the tape study, he can put combinations together. He can strike for volume. He's a guy who can choose what punches are his power punches in his combinations. And that's not something you normally see until a guy reaches the rankings or you have one of these sort of eye-catching top-tier prospects. So I'm really excited for this matchup. And normally in a main event where some guy is this big of a favorite, you just sort of assume that the UFC is setting Thomas Paul up to lose. But I don't think that's the case whatsoever. I really do think he has a good chance in this fight. It's just that he has to be fighting probably the... I, I don't know, the biggest prospect on this card. I don't think that's unfair to say. Brandon, Brandon Sanders saying last night was insane for those last two fights. It definitely was. Co-main event, fight of the year. I mean, listen, Nate Landwehr, David Onam, a wild fight. And then in the main event, Marlon Vera taking on Dominic Cruz. But when we focus in on Contender Series, Matt, we got to make the picks. My pick is Claudia Lechi as the underdog to get the win over Haley Cowan. 
I just really like the takedowns, really like the submission ability. And when I watch the two fighters strike, they both will throw head movement completely out and they'll strike for strike. And when they do that, Haley Cowan is trying to throw combinations to really blitz and then hold up against the cage. Whereas Claudia Lychee, I've seen her held up against the cage. I've seen her last three rounds and then some. And I've seen her continue to earn takedowns against fighters who have decent takedown defense. She's going out there breaking her opponents. And I think it's a question of when you look at her overall record, obviously Haley Cowan's been more active of late. But when you look at it for Lychee, she did views in 2016 a couple of speed bumps along the way 2019 2019 winning ways ever since has it been against the greatest level of competition no it's been on the brazilian regional scene it's been on the cyborg cards which you don't hear very often whereas Haley cowan obviously has the reputability of being a two-time all-american and acrobatics and tumbling but she also has the fact that she's fought with lfa for a very long time her last fight over with invicta she got the second round rear naked choke against an opponent who wasn't really kind of in there you know it, it was a 37 yeah. year old who had two years off who was 2-0 and oh. it was kind of an odd one I think I had a tweet that popped up on that one if you re-watch it with Invicta but I like Lychee in this fight and again this will be the first underdog that I picked on the season uh she's about a plus 122 underdog to Haley Cowan who's a minus 148 so I know Cowan a lot of people are gonna say she's gonna get the win more recognizable so on and so forth big camp too but I do like Lychee here out of Astro Fight Team. The connection again, Josie Andy Nunes, Tyla Santos. I think she's going to have a good fight here. She was originally supposed to take on Sarah Kaufman this year in Canada and an all-women's card in Calgary, but fell out. It says on Topology due to visa issues. So that's how highly regarded Lychee is. I think it's a good pick. So I do like her in this matchup against Cowan. What's so yours? you pick the underdog, and it's wild to me that I'm also about to pick an underdog right now because the first time that I looked at the odds for this fight, Jack Cartwright was a minus... Yeah, he was a minus four. 400. And I have no idea why the odds have come so close together. Now, I understand Jose Johnson has incredible power. He does have good takedown defense. He has okay takedown defense, I should say. But he is going to have a size advantage in this fight, and I do think that's going to help him, don't get me wrong. But Jack Cartwright has fought five-round fights. He has a pace for five-round fights, and it does feel to me that he has the counter for a lot of the moves that Jose Johnson does, especially on the feet. Now, I do worry about that one hit or quitter from Johnson, but if that's what he's going to rely on in most of his fights, and that's normally what he relies on in most of his fights, I like the overall experience out of a guy like Jack Cartwright and his well-rounded game plan going in there and just solving the puzzle that should be uh, Johnson. Now, this fight is probably going to be one of those fight of the night type fights. I could see it, I could see it going back and forth quite a bit, but I still feel like Cartwright has the much more sustainable MMA game, and I'm just really surprised to see where the odds were. I was going to ask you about that. Like, do you have any thoughts about that as to why they would have shifted so heavily? Because you rarely see a guy go from being a 4-1 to one favorite to being a slight underdog. Must be one of the... I don't know. I it really is, don't. It was very surprising for me to see, that's all. Because I was going to be like, oh, I don't want to pick such a big favorite on these shows. It's such a cheap cop-out. And then I looked at the odds and I was like, oh, I don't have to do that at all. So my pick is going to be Jack Cartwright, but I do think this will be a phenomenal fight. Yeah, I mean, both of us going with underdogs this week. Matt with Cartwright. I have Claudia Lychee. Let us know in the comments section down below who you have in these matchups. Let's chat. A little bit brisk because it's noon on a Sunday, but that's just the way it is this week. With the Contender Series, week number four, we have UFC 278, the video coming up in the not-so-distant future. And I mean, on that card, Kamaru Usman rematching with Leon Edwards, a fight wow. that's, what, like seven years in the making, 2015, their first matchup. We get some really fun fights. Paulo Costa's fighting Luke Rockhold. The undercard, and then, yeah, the return of a couple of big boys at 185 pounds. It should be a lot of fun. Enjoy the week that is out there. Keep it locked in with Fight Night Picks, Matt. As we always say, let's get into it. it.